in the context of, you know, every time, every time some movie comes out that was made from a book, you get all of this hate, you get all of this vitriol, you get all of these comments, oh, it's not the same, it's not like this, it's not like that. So this, this lecture is, uh, is designed or is meant to help us, hopefully, understand or maybe appreciate this whole context of um, book-to-film adaptations and, and probably start to give it some love or some sort of love uh, instead of just always giving hate, you know, let's let's try to come from a from an empathy empathetic type of perspective. Okay, so let me start my presentation. Cinema is considered one of the seven fine arts already, although it is the youngest, uh, considering it is just a little more than about a hundred years old. And cinema as a fine art is a coming together or brings together all of the six other arts. For instance. It is anchored in theater. The most, the most fundamental aspect of cinema is theater performance. You know, acting and and, and performing. Even terms like mise en scène uh, are are terms that are borrowed from theater. So, uh, cinema is essentially theatrics and uh, theatrical. Of course, cinema would not be the same without music, and music is as much a part of cinema from day one as as theater is. In fact, maybe even more so. Before, before people did theatrics on screen, they did music, and even silent films were were actually performed live in in parlors to a live band or to a live musician, live piano player. So there was always music involved with cinema. Dance uh, is not limited to just dance, you know, musicals, but uh, dance in in cinema really has to do with movement and and the use of the body to communicate. So it wasn't just uh, you know walking around. It was it was how you walked and how you moved and how you projected yourself. And that was that those are traditions that were born in dance, <laughs> visual art, of course, uh, concepts of balance and line and color and shape. All of these uh, all of these visual art principles are very inherent in cinema. And the reason why we love cinema as a medium is because it becomes it's like a live painting. And one of the one of the one of the aspects also that we don't normally see but one of the arts is architecture and architecture is all over cinema it's not just of course the sets but more importantly it's architectural structure cinema has structure films have shape and, and form and structures and stories have structure so beginning middle end top middle bottom these are all structural in nature and that is architectural in nature, how we understand the form and the shape of things and how they work with people, with audiences. And of course, last but not the least, and that's the topic of today's talk, is literature and the relationship of literature and the spoke and the written word uh, to cinema. Now, uh, what we have to understand, first of all, of course, uh, is that the first films, the, the films of the Lumiere brothers, of Edison, these were all documentary in nature. You know, films were by nature in the 1890s, in the late mid 1890s, they were nonfiction films. Uh, for instance, this image here of the train arriving at La Chota by the Lumiere brothers uh, was basically just a film, a short uh, two minute film of a train arriving at the train station. So, you know. That's it, and that, that was that, that that passed for it was acceptable. That already passed for entertainment back in the mid 1890s. So, shortly after that, you know what uh, the non the non uh, the fiction films rather took their inspiration now from what was already available: folklore, mythology, popular culture, and of course literature. You know where else would they get it? This was a brand new medium, and they had to get their inspiration somewhere. And they got it from these places, okay? Things that were already available, things that were already familiar. Uh, for instance, as early as 1898, there was already a cinematic adaptation of Cinderella. Uh, Cinderella was written in 1697. And then 1899- uh, no, my feedback. Lots of feedback. Oh, crap. What's the feedback? Wow. 
Why is there feedback? Okay, na po. Okay. How's this one better? Okay. So, continuing now. Continuing now. So, I was saying they were they were using their literature their classical literature and this is what uh, this is what we had you know they, again they had shakespeare and again so i was saying uh, most of the films that were being produced at the time most of these innovations that were being made in cinema and cinematic storytelling at the time were being done in europe particularly paris and germany okay so uh, so you got a lot of european uh, Western literature that was making it into cinema, cinematic pieces. Uh, George Méliès, again, French, uh, 1902, he did A Journey to the Moon, A Voyage to the Moon, rather. And these were adapted from Jules Verne stories. You had an Alice in Wonderland in 1903, Esmeralda, uh, one of the, by Alice Guy, one of the earliest female film directors. Uh, in history. Now, uh, I'll pause it here first for Esmeralda just to point out certain things because notice that the title is Esmeralda and it's it's adapted from The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And uh, films at this time, at, you know, in the early 1900s, they were on the average about 10 minutes long. You know, uh, a, a, long, a long film, a full film was 15 minutes. So, uh, the, 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 the conventions, the style for cinematic storytelling were really very short. And what they would do, there was no time to talk about or to tell the whole story of Hunchback of Notre Dame. So they would get excerpts, portions of stories, in this case, the love story of the captain and Esmeralda. And that was it. That was, that was the film. That, was the, that is what they made the film about. So this was the nature of, uh, of adaptation, something very, very simple simplistic very short story almost like a children's book in terms of how you know the kind of detail that they were going into with the film of course in the philippines we were not left behind in uh, 1919 the first filipino full-length film came out by jose nepomoceno dalagang bukid this was adapted by, from hermanas ilagans dalagang bukid the sarsuela and we are celebrating this year the 100th year of philippine cinema uh, because of this film, because of this first Filipino production, first Filipino directed film uh, for Filipinas by Filipinos. So uh, this is Dalagang Bukid. Of course, if the Western, if the Western world had Shakespeare, we had our Jose Rizal and uh, 1961 and 1962 respectively, Noli Mefatangre and El Filibusterismo was produced and directed by Jerry De Leon, who would move on to become our national artist for film. Uh, Jerry De Leon also, before he did Noli and Fili, did spin-offs of that. He, he produced and directed Sisa 10 years ahead. And Sisa, of course, a, a spin-off from, from one of Rizal's popular characters. So you notice that this is a, you know, adapted from, he created a film from one of the characters, picked up from where Rizal's novel would talk about Sisa, and then, you know, embellished it and gave uh, their own, his own spin on certain aspects and filled in the blanks of the story of one of the characters and how she, you know, meshed in and out of the story with Padre Damaso and, and Sosto Bibara and all of these guys. Okay, so uh, moving on, of course, one of uh, Philippine cinema's most iconic films, Manila Sa Kuko ng Liwanag, 1975, was actually adapted from Sa Mga Kuko ng Liwanag by Edgardo Reyes. Uh, some of our canon, uh, canon literature, you know, books that are studied in school and used as, in, as uh, school material, things like Bata Bata Pano Ka Ginawa was... Uh, produced in 1998, and Decada 70 in 2002. And of course, you know, in the US, they also, they also rely a lot. You know, just the same that we, that the Europeans use Shakespeare and we use Jose Rizal and things like Decada 70 to kill a mockingbird. 
uh, adapted in 1962. Again, one of the most highly acclaimed book to screen adaptations uh, of all time, the way it was put together. Locally, we we also adapt, we get from American literature. For instance, Hihintayin Kita Sa Langit by Carlito Sigron Rina uh, is actually an adaptation of Wuthering Heights. And was also ironic, uh, not ironically, uh, it was one of the films that kind of put Batanes on the map. Before then, people just knew of Batanes as the Babuyan Islands, but then suddenly, bam, you know, wow, ang ganda pala na Batanes because of films like Hihintayin Kita Sa Langit. And again, it's not just uh, canon literature. It's not just books. Uh, graphic novels have become part of the of the of the universe of book to film adaptations. In this case, you know, Coraline by Tim Burton, uh, a very successful, very popular adaptation, and uh, beautifully animated. Locally, of course, we have Jaja Saturna one among many, many, many adapted characters. This one by Carlo Vergara. And uh, you point out as well, a lot of our movie characters are actually comic adaptations. Uh, you know, the Darnas, the Zumas, the Captain Barbells, the Gagam Boys. These are, you know, the Chanaks. Uh, these are comic book adaptations. Many people don't even realize, for instance, that Darna, which is, I think, nine incarnations to date, uh, is, was developed by Mars Ravelo in the, in the comic book. So, you know, the, the character of Darna has actually found more life, no pun intended, in, on screen, long beyond it, uh, her, her, her existence in the comic book pages. And, of course, we cannot talk about... Um, uh, book to screen adaptations without really acknowledging the 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 pop the Britney Spears of of literature to film adaptations and these are the Hollywood blockbusters uh, Harry Potter Game of Thrones the the Nicholas Sparks books Crazy Rich Asians Hunger Games you know these and even slightly lesser known books like Wonder you know these are these are the these are the book. This is the meat of of book to screen adaptations that uh, that we're seeing and appreciating today, and this is really also where we're taking off with this whole discussion of why we hate them or why we love them. And you know, I guess for better or for worse, it depends really on how you interpret it. Authors, at the end of the day, want this to happen to them. They want to be the next George R. R. Martin. They want to be the next Smith Nicholas Sparks. You know, they want to be able to write this book that has enough mass audience appeal that you can take it, pick it up, and then turn it into this big Hollywood blockbuster. Because this is worth millions. It's, Harry Potter is worth billions. Billions, which means that J.K. Rowling is, is raking in crap loads of money for the very existence of Harry Potter. So, you know, at the end of the day, as an author, as a writer, who wouldn't want this to happen? Who wouldn't want to have their next film becoming the canon uh, or, or a genre-defining uh, piece of literature? And so they write and they do this. And you try to find an agent. You, you design your book or you work with other people just to, you know, to become the next George R.R. Martin, to be the next Kevin Kwan, in the hopes that Hollywood or a major film outfit or major film producing uh, sector like Korea would pick it up, pay crap loads of money, and turn you into the next global superstar. So, I'm going to pause right now and basically ask you guys the question why do we hate book adaptations? Okay, so feel free to chime in. You may unmute if you want, if you want to say your piece. Why do you hate or why do you dislike book to film adaptations? Anyone? Hello, sir. Hi there. This is Kat. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Kat. Uh, I think it's more of um, because whenever you read this book and you fell in love with it, you kind of have this expectation that sometimes uh, because the, the film has very limited time, like the, 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 the directors, I think, try to... Uh, shorten the version that makes the book that, that that makes the readers of that that 
book uh, somehow disappointed. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Anyone else? We have here in the chat, uh, Leah says, sometimes they remove crucial points from the book. Very good. And then Rod says, we imagined it differently. Anybody else? Why do you why do you dislike or why do you hate or what is it that you don't like about book to film adaptations? Nicole is saying changes that don't make sense. Yes, sometimes there are changes that don't make sense. What else? Anyone else have any other things that readers think are crucial to the plot and story, and they're sometimes omitted? Yeah, you know, something just didn't happen. And something something that you really wanted to happen didn't, and then suddenly cut to the next scene. Okay. So let's do a magic tallying up of why people dislike book adaptations. You guys are saying, for instance, that you know there are characters or plot points that are not uh, available in the film or are not are not seen in the film. Things that they things that you were expecting to be said in a certain way, or or words or language that was used, it just comes out differently. Uh, again, characters, timelines, plot points, situations—they're not faithful to the book. They're either omitted or shortened or meshed together. And what everybody's saying is that the reason why we do not like book-to-film adaptations is because it's not the same as the book, right? Yes, right. Chat came in. Right. <laughs> They're not the same, okay? They're different. Now, uh, I think it's Rod that, that, uh, that said it, or somebody said it. You know, simply put, we hate them because they're not what we thought they would be. It's not always because they did it any justice or did it, you know, that's, that's always secondary. But our expectations were not met. That's why we hate them or that's why we dislike them or that's why we just give it so much grief. So what is it, what is it that we like about books? What is it about books that, that make them books, okay? First of all, books have all the time in the world. The written page, the, the, the words on the page are permanent, which means that if you stop a story, stop a book in the middle, you close the book, you put it on the shelf and come back 20 years later, the exact story would be exactly the same. You can pick up exactly where you left off. Nothing changes. And the written word has every time to tell you a whole story, to describe everything that's happening. You know, it's leisurely. It, a, a novel, your, your typical airport novel, papier thick, takes you what? maybe eight hours, 12 hours worth of reading to accomplish, you know, that's, that's a lot of time. Maybe even more sometimes if you want to really digest what's going on. So books have all the time in the world. And books also are deep and they're rich. They, they describe to you in so much detail, telling you paragraph after paragraph, page after page after page, describing to you what people think, what people feel, what, pe what things look like, what they feel like. It gives you insights into thoughts of other people and you're able to describe it with detail. And books can do that. They can spend as many pages as, they're, as, they, are, as they can afford to describe feelings and textures and, and situations. And maybe one of the most wonderful things is books create worlds that only you can imagine. Books are very personal, which means that the words on the page are going to trigger visuals in your head that only you can hear, only you can see, only you can feel. And this is a world that is personally yours. When you first read Harry Potter, you are the ones now visualizing what Hogwarts look like, what the, what the robes look like, what Hagrid looks like, what Harry looks like, based on the descriptions that are given by the book. And that becomes a very, very, very personal thing because that's only yours and you cannot share that. You cannot make other people see what you see the way you're seeing it. Because when they read the same words on the page, they will see something different. So I'm gonna ask now, why do we like films? What is it about films? What is it, why, why do we bother watching? Why do we like it so much? What's, what's the big deal? Well, 
the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, films are immersive. Film cinema was designed to be watched in a dark room with you sitting, just with focused, you're focusing your attention on the screen. And that, that dark room, that single focus on the screen takes you into another world. And it takes you into a world that is created by another person. It takes you into the world of Star Wars, of Star Trek, of uh, The Notebook, of Avatar. You know, it, it, it just puts you all the way in. And the, more, and the more the technology improves with sound systems and seating and air conditioning and all of those things, all the more cinema becomes a world in itself. And that's an amazing thing. Also, cinema does something that few other media can do. It moves. It's motion picture. And that movement can spell the difference between something that is interesting and something that is captivating. There is no greatest showman without the dance, without the movement, without the flair, the flamboyance. And only cinema can bring that to you. That's why we love cinema so much. That's why we love film so much, because everything moves. And also more importantly, film, cinema makes the magic real. The magic that you're reading on the page, the wonder, the, 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 the sights that you see, the views that are being beheld become real when you may put them on film. They turn something that is a concept and gives, it, gives us something to, to hold on to, something to watch, something to appreciate. Now, this next scene, um, I'll have to apologize because the Google Meets does not transmit audio. So you will not hear anything from here. And I'll be giving a play-by-play a -play of what, what this, the significance of this clip is. Now, this is, this is a clip from Jurassic Park, 1993. And just as a context, OK, uh, Jurassic Park was written by Michael Crichton. Uh, that it came out, the novel came out about probably in 1989. 1990, thereabouts. And it was huge. It was a big international hit uh, as far as novels, books were concerned. People were eating it up. And uh, so finally, you know, Universal Studios turned it into, you know, bought the rights and turned it into a movie. Now, what made this film extra significant and why I'm showing it here is that this was also a time when there was very little CGI. You know, the movie technologies were evolving at the time. And CGI wasn't even a term yet. And this was also at the time when there were new dinosaurs that were being discovered in Utah. The Velociraptor was actually discovered about a year or two years before, during the production of this film. So it became even, no, sorry, a few years uh, before Michael Crichton wrote the book. So it was something very exciting for, for dinosaur freaks. A new kind of very hot you know, killer dinosaur, so exciting. So, so all the lead up to this movie, all the hype to this movie, was leading house, you know, Steven Spielberg was saying, hey, we're not, we did not use robots. For the first time, we're not using animatronics. We're not using robots for the dinosaurs. We're using computer animation. And we were like, wow, you know, but this is where, you know, that's not what you're seeing on screen. They're not, they're not robots. They're computerized. So people are like, whoa, talaga, so ano siya? So this is now, this point is about 20 something minutes into the film, right? And 20 something minutes into the film, and we have not yet seen a single dinosaur. So if you're a dinosaur freak, you're here, I'm watching, I'm here to watch the dinosaurs. Wala ka pa nakikitang dinosaur. So this is, this is the first time where supposedly the characters, uh, Dr. Grant, uh, by, played by Sam. Neil, he's a, he's a dinosaur expert. He's seeing the dinosaurs for the first time. And we're seeing, as an audience member, seeing the, audience, seeing the dinosaurs for the first time. So this is just suspenseful music. And he can see the dinosaurs, and we can't. And we're like, boy, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? She's, she's talking about this very ex this extinct plant that is alive right now. And she sees something. And then we see it for the first time. And the music swells up. So it's a triumphant music. 
we're seeing it for the first time and we as an audience were like, holy shit. It's a dinosaur, he says. So you could hear the dinosaur, they could come closer. And he says, we're gonna make a fortune with this place. He said, we clocked the T-Rex at 30, 32 miles an hour, T-Rex. You have a T-Rex. Yes, again. We have a T-Rex. So now we want to see the T-Rex. Like Dr. Grant, my dear Dr. Grant, welcome to Jurassic Park. And then we look. And swelling music. Da, 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 da. And then we see all of these dinosaurs. So it's not one dinosaur that was created, that was brought back to life. It's a whole bunch of dinosaurs. And you cannot capture that. You cannot say that in, in, in a book. It, it's still, yeah, okay, still kind of teary eyed. It's one of my favorite scenes ever, ever in cinematic history. Anyway, so having discussed all of that, you know, the difference between, between books and film, so why can't we just get along, right? Why can't people just be friends? Well, the truth of the matter is we can't get along because the world sucks and everybody will always have their own opinion of which one is better and which one is worse, okay? Let's, let's bring it back to the very basic, to the, to, the, to the fundamental aspects of what it is that books and films are trying to do. And what they're trying to do is tell a story. And storytelling can be, con can be defined as the conveying of events in words and images, often by improvisation and embellishment. Uh, and, and these, three, these three lines are, are, are very important in terms of defining what storytelling is. Conveying of events, which means if nothing is happening, then nothing can be told. So it's something has to happen. And you tell these things in words and images, which means that you can use so many different methodologies to tell a story. Of course, words, text, speech, dialogue, images, pictures, moving pictures, drawings, illustrations. But you can use music, you can use dance, you can use light to tell stories. And, you, and now these stories in words and images are often told by improvisation and embellishment, using one medium instead of another, using one form instead of another, using metaphor. And you embellish it, you make it more exciting, you make it bigger. That previous scene, for instance, from, from Jurassic Park, what, if, what happens if I was a filmmaker and I said, oh, dinosaur, show dinosaur. There's nothing wrong. I showed you the dinosaur, right? But look at what Steven Spielberg did. He held up, he prolonged it. So as so now as an audience member, I can see my characters, my 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 movie characters, they can see the dinosaur already. They're excited. They're like, whoa. And then me as an audience, what? Let me see, let me see, let me see. So now there's this anticipation. That's the embellishment. It makes, you know, just using simple camera technique, use simple editing, prolonging the agony, makes it more exciting for me. So by the time I see the dinosaur, I'm puli sa balita. But I'm seeing it now for the first time. I'm like, whoa. And that's the, that's the embellishment that, that, uh, that we're talking about. So what does this all mean? Ronnie Del Carmen, he's a, he's a director at uh, Pixar Animation, he's a Filipino, said that good storytelling is a simple story well told. Simple story well told. 
So which means that the core of the story, the mo the mo its basic its basis is is very simple, very clear, very sincere, very heartfelt. But you tell it in a fantastic manner. You tell it in a way that works, that in a way that is compelling to an audience. Case in point, Babe, which many people did not know was an adaptation. Babe, it's a simple, simple story of a pig that just wanted to be like a dog, to be loved like a dog, to be, to live like a sheep dog. And it was, and both the book and the, and the film, you know, it was sweet and sincere and nice. It was beautifully told. It was well told. But the story was very simple. A pig that wanted to live his life the way he wanted to live it. That's it. You know, the rats, the, the, the duck, the, the, the sheep dogs and all of that sky. You know, they were, they were they're secondary to that central story core. That simple story part. And then it was well told. Beautiful acting, beautiful animations, wonderfully put together, gorgeous lines, sincere, uh, sincere performances. So you had Pei, you know, one of the world's most loved films. Da Vinci Code. And Da Vinci Code comes from Dan Brown's airport novel, airport literature. Uh, of the same title, Da Vinci Code. Now, airport literature, airport novels, they're called that way, you know, they're about yay thick. Uh, because this is the type of thing that you buy at these book stands, bookshops in airports, and you know, you, they're not deep, they're not, they're not um, world-changing pieces of literature. They're very pop. Again, they're like the Britney Spears of, of, uh, of the book world. You know, there's no substance to it. But you know, people enjoy it. You know, you watch it. It's 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 easy reading. It's easy listening. It's easy watching, and all of that. So, Da Vinci Code took the world by storm again, like a Michael Crichton film, and then, uh, and then, when 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 they adapted it into a into a book, it took on a different life because now all of these concepts, all of these these uh, these ideas about uh, the Rosicrucians, the Templars, uh, Codexes, and Da Vinci, and all of these things that, that Dan Brown was putting in his book came to life in Ron Howard's film with Tom Hanks. So they worked together. The film was able to explain things that the book was a little vague on because, again, it's just written word. Okay? So, again, story well told. This is another. Uh, another phenomenon, for instance, Mario Puzo wrote in 1969, The Godfather, and it was a lousy book. Godfather is a lousy book. It's boring. But Francis Ford Coppola found something, saw something, the potential in that story, and picked it up and turned it into The Godfather. Godfather, the movie, is actually better than the book. People, uh, people just really went back and bought the book because they wanted to read the book that The Godfather was made of, but Godfather as a movie was so much better than the book itself. And, and which also says, that, you know, again, simple story, good story, well told. So it was well told in The Godfather, the movie. Well, it was not as well told in Mario Puzo's The Godfather, okay? Because Mario Puzo has a tendency to, he's, he writes long and slow and it's not much of a page turner, okay? It's a little bit slow paced as far as a writer is concerned. Oh, and then we have garbage, like uh, Twilight, okay? Now, Twilight, this is the opposite of Godfather uh, in the sense that, well, no, not opposite. You see, uh, what's this? Twilight, all four books of it is garbage, okay? Uh, it's garbage. So, but the thing with this piece of garbage is that, um, is that people read it. People bought it. You know, there was there was a lot of hype that went behind it. A lot of a lot of um, a lot of hype. A lot of marketing that went behind it, and people bought the book and people read it and all of us. So what's Hollywood going to do? Hollywood is going to buy their rights and turn it into a movie, and you know, and they turned it into garbage the movie. And and they still watch it. You know, so so you know, from from my perspective, you know, they got garbage and they just put it on film. So which is which made it smell a little better, but did not necessarily turn it into gold. But that's my opinion, because ultimately, 
Twilight the books and Twilight series, the, the movie made a lot of money. So ultimately, the producers, the authors, the publishers, they all take home a nice big chunk of change. And um, vamp- Sparkly Vampire Boy, see Edgar, uh, you know, he's now, he's now the new Batman. And the, this girl who can't act still can't act. And her Charlie's Angel remake died, just flopped. That's necessarily karma. That's neither here nor there. Okay, we will find out next year how Sparky Vampire Boy does as bad person. Okay, and of course we can't talk about uh, successful, wonderful adaptations if we don't mention Harry Potter. And Harry Potter probably is one of the that you know that's the ideal, that pinnacle of transforming literature into cinema, because. The thing with Harry Potter is we were reading Harry Potter and then there was this really magical world that, that the author immersed us in. You know, it was full, it was complete. From the cups to the signages to the walls to the everything was was built into the book. So when it was turned into a film, this is the one thing that people wanted to see. We want to see the magic. We want to feel as magical about uh, Harry Potter as the book. And Philosopher's Stone did that, that first Harry Potter film. It did that. It brought everything into reality. And that's, that was it. You know, it's a simple story of a boy that just really wanted to live a normal life, even if everything around him was not normal. He's a wizard. He's being hunted by bad guys. All of this, he just wants to be normal. He just wants to live normally, like a normal kid. And that's the story of those L- L- seven Harry Potter books. But that's all he wants to do, and that, that's captured wonderfully in the films, okay? And particularly the first one, because that was the most innocent, that was the most pure of all of the Harry Potter films. So, as we go on, uh, can we try not to hate on film adaptations, okay? At this point, I'll pause again. Are there any questions? Are we good? Are we still here, or are you all bored now? Oh, there's five chat messages. I wasn't getting the beeps. Okay, let me let me answer. Okay, all good, all good. Very immersive. Oh, all good. Okay. Oh, you guys are sweet. Let's. I'll just check the questions. If there's anything, if anyone's asking anything, Edward. Oh yeah, him. Okay. So let's continue. Point. Now. I said, let's try not to hate. And what, what, what I'm asking, what I'm, I'm coming from a filmmaker perspective, I'm coming from the cinema perspective, is rather than hating and trying to separate the two, let's try to find a connection between cinema and the books. Look at them as a connection. Find the, their, it's, yes, they may be the same story. For example, you know, Hunger Games, the book is being turned into Hunger Games, the movie. But find a connection. Connect them together. They are part of the same universe even if they're different, they are connected. So what is that connection? Why are they together? What, what is the purpose of one? What is the purpose of the other? Okay? And after connecting, understand that cinema and, and literature have different ways of visualizing and interpreting. And film can visualize and interpret in ways that books cannot. I'm, I'm going to show you this example here of World War Z. World War Z, Max Brooks' book, and... Then a few years later, World War Z, the movie with Brad Pitt. Now, uh, most of us, or many of us, have, saw, have seen, have watched World War Z or have caught parts of it. And basically, uh, it's basically Brad Pitt running around being chased by zombies. Fine. The book, though, and few people have read this, is actually not the story of Brad Pitt running around being chased by zombies. World War Z is, uh, is written as an anthology of different people's testimonials of their experiences during the zombie apocalypse. And it is written in chronology, which means that the ordering of the, of the testimonials give you a timeline of what happened from beginning to end of the, uh, of the, of the apocalypse. And, and that's what it's about. That's how, that's how the book is written. It actually does not have running zombies. You know, it's not about that. In World War Z, the movie is essentially the a story of one person from that book. That's, that is what, that's how you view it. So when you look at these two volumes together, these two materials together, they actually connect to each other. 
if you just look at World War Z and you're going to look at World War Z, the book, and, and try to say, hey, that's not the story in the book. There's nothing like that in the book. That didn't happen in the book. There's no Brad Pitt character. Nobody went to the U to, to Korea for, for some mission. That's because it's not about translating the book. It's about getting the essence of the book and turning it into something you can see. Because the book cannot describe fast running zombies, zombies that run and fly through windows. Uh, you know, the, the kind of transformation that happens with when people get bitten, having to chop off that Israeli soldier's arm and all of that. It's the visualization, the interpretation that is brought about by the movie is very different from what you can do in a book. And the stuff that you can tell in the book, you cannot tell that, you, you, know, you cannot sell that movie if you were going to do it in anthology the way the book did. It's going to bore people to death. It's called the documentary. Because the book was a documentary. The movie was, was your you know, Hollywood blockbuster. So they visualize and they interpret things differently. And both of them, literature and film, do something that we should get together, you know, agree on, that they create worlds that we can all believe in. Create worlds that we can all believe in. I said earlier, when you read a book, you, you're, the book creates for you a world that only you can see. And if, if there's five of you in a room reading the same book, you're seeing five different worlds. The film does that for hundreds of people, thousands of people at the time. It gives you one world. So between the book that creates the world from the beginning and the film that gives us all the same world, these two work together to create a world that we can all believe in. And that's the connection. That's the visualization. That's the interpretation. Which brings me now to this concept of transmedia storytelling. Okay, It's a fairly new concept. And transmedia storytelling is telling a story or story experience across multiple platforms and formats using current digital technologies. And I use the Star Wars in the background as um, deliberately because Star Wars is one of those prime examples of what transmedia storytelling is about. Storytelling, remember, it's not just about the single story, okay? It is also about telling the story experience. And what is the story experience of Star Wars? What is Star Wars about? Star Wars is a, Star Wars is essentially a cowboy movie. It's good versus evil. That's all it is. It's good versus evil. It's 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 a it's a soap opera. There's nothing deep about the stories of, of Star Wars, but look at how the story experience is told across so many things. You have the nine canon films, you have the spin-offs, you know, solo, rogue one, you have TV series like Mandalorian, you have games you have that uh, set an xbox game where you where you're, you know you're playing with the lightsaber and you're doing these dance dance revolution things but using a lightsaber those are part of the story experience and each one using a particular digital technology fan fiction um animated you know clone wars which is an animated version uh the different kinds of games games on on your tablet on your phone on, on a desktop on a console, all of these things are, are different stories, but different, but part of the same experience. And that's what transmedia storytelling is about. It's finding, it's finding and leveraging on the power of particular mediums to tell the story. So Xbox has a different way of telling a story and it can do things that a book cannot. For instance, in Xbox, you can, you're interactive. You, you play, you know, which means that it's user-driven uh, experience. Which, can, which you can do on, let's say, if you guys remember Bandersnatch. That was user-driven, but it was also very limited. And you cannot put that in a game because then it'll be boring because it's too limited. But you can use it in, you can do a hyper-narrative in a TV or like Netflix. You can do six episodes of Mandalorian or six, eight episodes of Mandalorian. Okay? But Mandalorian, the, the movie, might not work. Not the way it's being told because again it's very you know it doesn't have those big action scenes that you need and expect in a big cinema screen that are being given to us by the big uh star wars movies so, so there you go you know that's what that, it's it's again transmedia storytelling is telling or using digital technologies using platforms to tell or share a single story experience but capitalizing on the power of that medium using the power of that medium. Now, um, 
related to transmedia storytelling, let's take you back. Everybody is familiar with Sleeping Beauty. Okay, and Sleeping Beauty is a is a, is a story. It's a fairy tale. We call it a fairy tale written by the Brothers Grimm in the 1600s, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, and so if it's a city 1600s, we're talking about 500 years, 400 years of of Sleeping Beauty. And in the 1930s, Walt Disney picked it up and turned it into an animated feature. Okay, and one of the first Disney princesses. Uh, I think it's, she's the third one. Uh, Sleeping Beauty. And in Sleeping Beauty, we get introduced to the evil queen or evil fairy, the, this, this evil witch named Maleficent, who in the 2000s, Disney created a movie for her, a movie about her. So notice now that we had Sleeping Beauty, the story, translated into Sleeping Beauty, the animated feature, which tells you know its story for children. So it's it's a little it's a little more wholesome. You put the you put the spells, the bibbity bobbity boo, the dragons, whatever, all of these things, you know, fall into place. And then what's it? Sixty years later, seventy years later, translating that same story or picking up from that story, turning it into a prologue, into a prequel, and turning it into the story of Maleficent. And what is interesting is that Maleficent is not the story of, of the evil uh, fairy. It's a story of how she becomes evil. She's actually good. She becomes the heroine. We, we feel for her. She's a scorned lover. She was cheated and hurt by a man. And we feel for her. And we say, no wonder she became bitter. No wonder she got pissed. The, ca the cartoon painted her as some evil witch. She's not evil. She's just pissed. You know, she's not happy. So now we have the story of Maleficent. Then you notice it's the same story experience. Huh? This is still Sleeping Beauty. But we're already spinning off. We're already moving away from the Sleeping, the sleeping Beauty thing. So anyway, this is in the 2000s, right? We have the story of Maleficent. And very recently, uh, I think it was last year, I was going around fully booked and then I saw this. This is a book. This is a book entitled Mistress of Evil. And it's a story of Maleficent. It's a book. So notice now that we have come from the move from this, the book of Sleeping Beauty into the movie of Sleeping Beauty, into the movie of Maleficent, and back now to the book of Maleficent. So the story has come for full, full circle. It well, maybe not connecting, but it's it's come back to the book which means that there are things that we can talk about, there are stories that we can tell. The experience of Maleficent is now being told in another medium. And beside the story of Maleficent, there was this. It's a collection of the, e of the it's, a collect, it's a Disney collection of the villains and their stories. Okay, so you have now Gerthel for, from from Rapunzel, Ursula, evil stepmother, and you have the beast as well. Again, all of them movie experiences, all of them coming from, originally from books, Little Mermaid is Hans Christian Andersen, okay, and, and translate and coming back because it's a different experience. It's part of the same, sorry, it's part of the same experience. It's a different story. It's part of the transmedia universe that we are trying to create. Okay, so we have questions here. So are book to film adaptations are character driven? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, char character character driven is is a is a method of telling the story. Okay, because it can also be plot driven, and and many books are plot driven. You know, there where we usually talk about the better ones, but there are lots of books that are plot driven and not don't focus on the character. So again, it does not mean that just because you're doing book to film doesn't mean that you're working on the character. The advantage lang kasi of, of working from a book, okay, especially if it's a novel with something rich, is that if it's well written, if the book is well written, the character has a lot of of depth. Because it's described and all of that. So you have a lot to work with when you translate your character into film. But if, of course, if you're working from Dr. Seuss 
for instance. Dr. Seuss has almost no character development, very little character development. So as a, as a filmmaker, if you want to make a full-length film about uh, the Lorax, for instance, you have to be the one to fill in and do the character development. If not, it becomes a plot-driven film. So the question here is, um, is it important to build a fictional world to create story experiences if it's set in a real world rather than a galaxy? Uh, you have to create the world. The world can be a real world, but it has to be a world that your audiences believe in. It's not just it's not just an it's not just the a book or a film. It's also the book. You uh, look at Nicholas Sparks. Yes, suspension of disbelief. Look at Nicholas Sparks. Nicholas Sparks. It's all real world. But come on, the Notebook. Really now, you know that kind of. Boy meets girl, boy meets, falls in love with girl, you know, very rom com, and then they write things in the notebook, and he's telling, and they date, they, they die, and sabay, you know, oh, come on, that doesn't happen, not in the real world. Sorry to, you know, sorry to burst your particular bubbles, but it doesn't happen. But the world is so believable, the world is so real that that we cry, we, we it's ugly cry. Because it's so real, and that's very important. Because if, if your audiences, if your reader does not believe the world that you make for them, then the story has no impact. Because you're you're making your characters do things in relation to that world. But if the world is not believable, then nobody believes what your characters are doing. Does that make sense? Okay, so moving on. So, what's my next slide? Ah, okay. So, um, ultimately, okay, ultimately, and I'm wrapping up now, uh, they're very different. Books, films, they're extremely different. Today we have digital literature, we have games, we have uh, hyper narratives like Bandersnatch, we have um, mini series. Uh, mini series has, has had a new has a new has a new life brought it back into it ever since Game of Thrones. You know they're more cinematic than ever, but they're not films, they're not TV shows. They are, you know brought about by the Netflix era. Um, so the media, the mediums are changing. The audiences are changing. But what we have to look at when we're talking about books and films is that they're different, but they are together. They do things that are similar, but also do things so different, differently. They are apples and oranges, but they're also both fruits. So forcing them apart or forcibly comparing them together is not going to work for anyone. That's why we hate it because we're always trying to see, we're trying to see the film in the book and we're trying to see the book in the film. No, they don't. They don't work that way together. They ha uh, Books have, like I said, they have time, they have depth, and then they have imagination. Film, they have, they have immersion, they have movement, and they have magic and reality. So, it's not it's not about pulling them apart and 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 saying one is better than the other, but it's actually bringing them both together and seeing how one does something better than the other. Uh, one common question whenever I do this lecture is: Is it better to read the book first or watch the film first? I say, no, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter because one can always do something that the other one cannot. I'm not defending films for taking up chunks or, or reinterpreting or killing characters or not putting them in at all. That's, you know, you're translating a 10-hour novel, a 10-hour yeah, 10 reading novel into a two-hour film. So something has to die. Something has to disappear. That's normal. But, you know, watch the film because you want to see how the reality turns out. You want to see how, how the world imagined by the author becomes reality. But you read the book because you want to see how people think. You want to read how people think, how people talk, how people process things. You want to you want the author to have a chance to explain to you all of the little things. Bakit ganito? Why did things happen this way? And it's all going to be described in the book because it's text. Okay. And as I wrap up, we can't ever remove that context of books. You know, because as they say, the older the book, the better the smell. 
And if you're going around smelling DVDs or VHS tapes, you're really strange, okay? Uh, and there's molds and fungus in VHS tapes, so don't go around smelling those things. But books, books smell wonderful the older they get, okay? And even if it gives us fungus and we'll, we'll coat our lungs with dust and everything, nobody cares because they smell amazing. And that's the wonder of a book. And you can't ever remove a book from, from its context. But, you know, uh, I know there's no sound in this one, but, but I just have to show it to you because I still have to read a book that is able to do this. And this is a scene. Again, I'm sorry there's no sound that I can transmute this. So you can just search for it. This is Red Violin. Uh, this is an excerpt from The Red Violin. Uh, it's a movie. And you can look for the Pope. Um, what's his name? Francis Pope? Edward Pope. Edward Pope uh, performance, okay? And it is a violin performance in a, for an audience, okay? And I'll just let you watch it and then I'll talk, to you, I'll talk to you guys about it. This is about two minutes long. What you wish, what you just witnessed there, there, ladies and gentlemen, is something that you cannot do on a book. Okay. That was a sex scene. That was a two-minute musical sex scene. And and you just can't do that in a book. You can put all the notes of the music, but if you don't you know how to read music, then you don't know what it will sound like in your head. And that can be done in a book. And so that's, a, again, going there, there are things that, that a book can do that a film will never be able to do. And then there's things a film will do that a book will never be able to do, such as presenting a two-minute musical sex scene with absolutely no sex. So with that, uh, floor is open now for questions. Thank you very much for those who are listening. Uh, if you wish to receive a digital certificate of attendance, please leave your email address in the chat. Uh, the floor is open now for questions. Any comments on the state of local literature and how it relates to local filmmaking? I've noticed more local books are getting recognized. Yes, uh, more and more local books are slowly getting recognized. The problem is because uh, Filipinos as a society, as a market, as a market especially, yeah, we're not big readers. Uh, so we're more an oral culture because that's why cinema resonates so much with Filipino society, but books not as much. So slowly, you know, smaller and smaller circles, uh, a lot of Wattpad literature. Yes, it's plebeian, no? but at least things that younger people are writing online on a digital medium, they're slowly getting integrated and brought into cinema. So yes, it start, there's some sort of... Uh, slow but but gradual it's getting there where we're starting to find stories uh 
it's actually easier to write a short story than it is to write a screenplay. So sometimes a lot of writers now or producers, they find inspiration in short stories and novels by Filipinos because those are usually richer and already better well-written, more, more, more robust. So when you translate it now, you know, into a screenplay, you're not working from zero, from a zero idea. Uh, similar to what I said about the character development context earlier. So once it's already on the written page, there's already some character development, you're just going to translate that into film. For Philippine concept, where are we in terms of film, book to film adaptations? Again, Kat, as I said, uh, hard to kind of say. We're getting there. For a while, we were doing a lot of Wattpad, um, Wattpad adaptations. And, and not necessarily Wattpad, but you know what I'm talking about. These are short uh, digital literature, literary pieces. So um, that's also because we don't, they're not a huge market for for Filipino-made novels, sadly. And we even have a lot of, of classical literature that, that's not being produced or it's not being, um, it's not yet being produced. So there, there is that. So getting there slowly, but we're getting there. Well, film, uh, film uh, what's my favorite book to film adaptations? I have to say, I have to say it's the Harry Potter series. Um, I'm a big Potterhead, and and from the first first few pages palang of Harry Potter, I said this has to be a film. This is long before they made it into a film, but this is, has to be a film. You know, the 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 book wasn't able to contain the kind of magic that cinema can bring to it. So that would be it. Sir, what do you think about the Wattpad book to film adaptations? I don't watch them, <laughs> so I can't say I can't also be I can't be. Um, categorical about it but you know again because Filipinos are not big readers we're not a big literary society so you know until we get there sige use Wattpad use Kababawan use use the Britney Spears use 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 pop pop literature as it is na nga, a lot of our book to film adaptations are not uh, are not the Jose Rizal si man lang eh in the Kariya, we have Dekada Setenta, we have Painila Sokoko ng Liwana. But a lot of our adaptations, if you're going to learn the number of films, are comics. Comic, comic books. Wakasan. You know, all of these love stories, these hihintay and natintay. You know, but all of these, these, these musical adaptations, music pa, become the inspiration for a, for a film. But we, we, we rely a lot on comics because we're more visual that way. So get Darnas, get the, get the Wakasans, get the, the Chanaks and the Capres and the you know, folklore legends that's where our stories come from it's not from novels it's not uh, we're not big on that uh potterhead here okay cute question in ampas one of are the panels for adapted screenplay read uh no they don't they don't read the original literary form at the uh 50 shades was controversial i don't say ko doon uh Fifty Shades, from a literary perspective, is a little bit less garbage than Twilight. Pero, again, it's it's not about uh, what exactly do you mean by the controversy, pala, because of the sex and the and the the S and M, the BDSM, the bondage thing. Josh, is that you know what exactly? What exactly were you referring to when it comes to the controversies? Uh, if the controversies are there, I thought that the movie and did not really contribute more to the experience of the book. Well, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I watched portions lang of enough with shades because na pasu na ako sa Twilight. You know, I wasted parts of my life already for that. I wasn't gonna add to it, um, but. Uh, this is my take on the the take on that. Okay, again, look at look at visualization and interpretation. Yung sinabi ko. Uh, the film had the potential of showing us. Uh, let's start with the book. Sorry, let's start with the book. Fifty Shades was not about the love story between um, the rich guy and the poor girl, right? It wasn't about that. It was really it, it's really soft core pornography. It was about bondage. That was the milieu bondage, and 
you know, it was talking about butt plugs. It was talking about uh, whips and belts and, and, and straps and all of these things. And the reason why it made so much money, and remember the Fifty Shades of Grey is not designed, it's not written for men, it's written for women. So this was tickling with their imaginations. This was the reason why, why it's slightly less garbage than Twilight. Twilight was written for 12-year-old girls. Okay, so it's basically just some glorified fairy tale. Fifty Shades was written for an older, more mature market. In fact, it's written for 20-something, 30-somethings, 30-something-year-old women. Women were either not getting any or are not that happy, which means that, yeah, they're having some, but, you know, they have sex. But what, what, what Fifty Shades was bringing in was, wow, exciting. Oh, my God. Aren't they just, oh, you can do that? Oh, how kinky. Diba? Uh, so when the film came out, what you're basically doing is, okay, here we go. Let's see what you're talking about now, about these plugs and these whips and these chains and all of that. Because it's a bit hot the book. When I was reading the book, ganito, ganito, you know, I was getting to sweat, I played with myself, whatever all those these, these women said. And now comes the movie and it's like, eh, quack, quack, quack. So it's not controversial in terms of content. It's just like people are really disappointed because here was your opportunity. This is what film could have done. Film could have done, made the fantasy real. It didn't. That's why people are disappointed. That's why people hate it. Of course, look at it from the other side. Uh, you cannot watch, if you were going to turn... Uh, if you're going to turn Fifty Shades of Grey into what it really is in movie version, you're not watching it in Green Belt. You're watching it on Pornhub. Because you cannot show that stuff to the public. It's not, not, the way, not the way it was going on in the book. Not the stuff that they were doing. So there's that trade-off as well. Maybe not the best material pala to turn into a film. What people really just did, what producers did, is just capitalize, capitalize on the money. They bought the rights. Hey, boom, mabenta to. So, you know, they made the producer turn to movie, showed it to people. People paid money to watch. And sorry if you didn't like it. That's the thing about film, kasi. You always pay before you watch. You never pay after. So, as far as your the movie producers are concerned, you've paid. It doesn't matter whether you like the film or not. You paid me. So, if you, if you put enough money into marketing beforehand, people pay a lot before they watch. You don't have to rely on word of mouth. Not like festival films, for instance, where usually they don't have money for marketing, so they're hoping that people will like it and talk about it. So people pay after. Or people come, more people come in after. Any other questions? Yes, Patrick, it sells a lot. A lot. Okay, I read criticism on Nicholas Sparks that he writes more cinematic compared to his earlier books. Any thoughts? Yeah, why not? Why not? It works, eh? It's like, um, it's like, let's see, who can I give us an example without casting a lot of shade? Um, think of a musician or think of a, of a film director, for instance. Uh, Ah, okay. And this is not casting shade, huh? Um, Mick Red's Birdshot. Okay. Uh, fresh, new, amazing. You know, it was telling story. It was telling a story in a way that was so different and so ang ganda ng pagkashoot, ang ganda ng ano. That was Birdshot. Same director for uh, what's his Block Z. And it's like, um, anyari, what happened? Now, of course, there's a lot of things, you know, budget, producer, market, all of those things. But the same thing with Nicholas Sparks. Yumaman ka ni. Kumita na yung libro mo eh. For us being, you know, it was already adapted into film. So, so sometimes, whether conscious or unconscious, you start writing in the, in the hopes that this next one will be, kasi nakakabenta ka ni. Uso ka ngayon eh. So, let's say, People buy his first, uh, buy his first, first book. Shit, kumita. Pam! International blockbuster. Made billions. I will buy your next three books. All right, now I'm making a shitload of money. So the next book is going to write already designed to go into that system. I, I, ano na, dinidesign na siya para bilihin. 
so that when Universal looks at it or when Paramount looks at it, oh, okay, yeah, that, that's already a movie na. Akin yan. Oh. So, you know, why not write for the screen instead? But how can he sell books? Remember, he's still a book author. And his publishers, the publisher is like your studio, it's like your record label. They're also telling you, oi, oi, wag ka ganyan magsulata. Or write like this, write like that. Here. It's just like, it's, it's not as a... It's not, it's not as pure as you think it is. Even J.K. Rowling has somebody over her saying, no, this is not nice, change it. So, there's that. Okay. Uh, what do you think of using poetic cinema, Taraga, Ivan's childhood, and translating books of film, but to be effective method for child adaptation? Yes and no. Uh, it depends what you're, what you're at adapting but it also depends what you're showing for example if you're doing art films uh poetic cinema for instance there there's an art to it you know, i mean there's a quote-unquote an art aspect to it there's a, uh, there's a reason why it's being done so translating or adapting a book is not necessarily the the point of it or it could be an interpretation not like for instance um again uh let's say hunger games diba sinasa pelikula mo so so there could be a purpose. Now, is it an effective method of adaptation, poetics? Not necessarily, but it could be possible. Puede, puede naman. Um, but it depends on the story, depends what your, what your objectives are as a filmmaker. That's what happens. Okay, last question ko, sir. Ano po masasabi niyo doon sa Mulan adaptations? I don't know much about it, pero parang it's about race daw po. No, Mulan is a Chinese legend. Okay, or history, and it's one of their it's one of their Diego Silangs. Uh, it's their Emilio again. It's their Goyo. It's their General Luna in Mulan. Uh, now, it has become about race, not because about not not because of the story. The story of Mulan is the story of Mulan. It's become about race because of the way that Hollywood produced it or produces it. Because Hollywood has a has a tendency to do what is called white whitewashing, and that is uh, whitening, whitening characters, making them white Americans, white Caucasians. Uh, so, the, one of the major criticisms about Mulan was that they first casted a non-Chinese actress, or they were they were about to cast a non-Chinese actress. So, para and yon. Itong cool sa China yung ano, magkakas ka ng kung sino-sinong hayop dyan. There was a recent one where Charlie Inantra, where the Scarlett Johansson was casted as a as an Asian ata or something. Yan yung mga whitewashing. So it's not, it, it, the, the, it raised issues were, were about the production, the mode of, the way it was put together, not the content. Even though sa, some adaptations are cash cows, yes they are, uh, they still create something that adds to the original. True naman, true. Add more garbage to garbage, true. Is it still garbage, but at least there's more garbage to explore? Oh, naman. Oh, naman. And this is me na lang, I hate a lot on, I, I throw a lot of hate on Twilight. But people, for example, like Sam Havilosa, she's a film major, uh, love it. So, you know, just because I hate it doesn't mean that it's all bad. Just because it's garbage, just because I say it's garbage doesn't mean that I'm lying. Diba? So there's that. Why is it that multiple film adaptations occur? Did the first one stop? Did they simply want to take it on another day? Yes, but not necessarily stop because means that the first ones or the earlier ones are just as good. It's just that the story is so good. Uh, Alice in Wonderland has been remade so many times because it is a good story. There's a lot of richness to Alice in Wonderland. There's a lot of ways that you can interpret it. Darna. If you're going to look at the history of Darna in the Philippines from, from the Vilma Santoses and the Nora Honors to the Alice Dixons to the, to the um, Angel Loxins, they're very different. The, the Adarna as, as, a, as, a, as a character in comics has always been very sensual, very sexual. I mean, she wears less than Wonder Woman. Okay? Because Darna is in a two-piece. Wonder Woman is always in a one-piece. Anyway, but the, 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 the there are incarnations of Darna which are more sexy versus less sexy. And, and that tells you a lot about, about the, the perspective or the or the um, the 
the philosophy or the ideology of the filmmakers or the producers. Uh, even the, the, the darnas of today are more empowered than the darnas of before. There's more women empowerment, again, sign of the time. So, so there's a really different take, different way of interpreting this. Uh, what, did, what do you think about Gone Girl? I loved it. The author wrote the screenplay, and because of that, it's faithful to the book. Yeah. Ah, there you go. Ben said, Ghost in the Machine. Yeah, whitewashing. So, yes, I love Gone Girl. And Galing, no? The author wrote the screenplay. There you go. But it's a good thing that the author wrote the screenplay of Gone Girl because it's so difficult to write Gone Girl. So, 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 so difficult. The magic of Gone Girl is, is literally every other sequence is a plot twist. And that's so difficult to write. So, so difficult to write. If I was... If I was uh, if I was a writer and, and the producer said, oh, can you write Gone Girl? I said, no, I'm not going to write that. I'm not going to touch that. Bring in the author because he knows how to write like that. He knows how to write that the way he wrote it. So that's there you go. Controversy in the it's about lead actors supporting the age. No, yeah, there's that also. That, that's a political boycott. Eh? But it wasn't a racial issue. Broad. And it flopped. Mulan flopped though in the U.S. And they skipped the, they postponed the China screening. Sir, follow up, but can they be turned into full length films or not necessarily? They can, but what you have to do is you have to understand the uh, you have to understand the the context in what it's about. The problem lang kasi with short stories, if they're written properly as a short story, it's set as that. You know, the the story developed and the plot development, the character development, the the milieu, the situation, they're all set for a small space. Turning that into a two hour film. It's not necessarily going to work. It's not necessarily going to work. So it can, but you know, again, you're stretching it. So there's going to be a lot of gaps that you have to fill up, or if not, it becomes too slow because the cara the, the development, the story development is designed for a short form. It can maybe stretch it into a long form. Oh, the the title. It's film parody, an adaptation, or a commentary. You need to have licenses for that. No. You don't need a license for it. If you're doing a parody of an existing piece, uh, you do not need a license for it. It is not an adaptation either. It is a commentary. My high school friends loved your lecture. Can they join the? Oh, yes, of course. Of course. Hi, high school friends. Yes, yes, my lectures will be public. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Hope you had fun. Hope you learned something. Tell your friends, these lectures are free. And if you want, uh, they're all for free, but I do accept donations of dive gear, food, uh, oatmeal raising cookies. Night, Ben. Okay, so thanks, uh, thanks so much, guys. I'm stopping the recording now.